Live from Case at 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. A day of reflection and assessment for the Jefferson High School community after that chaos during a campus lockdown yesterday. Panicked parents rushing at the school and officers after a possible threat was called in. Now, there was no shooting, and after sweeping the school, officers did not find a weapon. Today, Courtney Friedman spoke to students, parents, and the school district about what they've all learned from the situation and what changes they want to see. We just thought it was a drill, honestly, and then things started escalating. We heard cop car sirens, we heard the choppers above. They just grabbed all the children and put them against the wall, turn off the lights and stuff. Sisters Sarah and Caitlin Estrada said the students and teachers around them remained calm during the lockdown at Jefferson High School yesterday, but outside the school, chaos. Go get them before we're there. On the heels of officer inaction at Robb Elementary in Uvalde, many parents let fear take over, rushing the building, screaming for their kids to be let out. I spoke with a lot of parents here yesterday, right as the chaos was breaking out here on the Jefferson High School campus, and a lot of them told me that they had not received information from the district. So what they want to see moving forward is better communication. At the scene, SAISD Communications Director Laura Short said information was sent out. A phone call first, followed by a, an email message. In the future, uh, a text message will go out as well for those that we have phone numbers on record. I didn't get word from the school until like about an hour and a half in. It was about 2.45, 3 o'clock when I got that. Sarah and Caitlin's dad, Gene Estrada, says somehow word didn't make it to everyone in time, and he likes the idea of a text alert. There has to be a specific different notification that this is an emergency. In a statement released to today, SAISD right. Superintendent Jaime Aquino said, we empathize with all of you. It's important to know when a school is locked down, students and staff cannot be released until officers determine the threat has been resolved, give clearance, and lift the lockdown. In the future, we will deploy district staff to the campus grounds to keep families on scene informed of what's happening and the status of the reunification process. There is policies that we have to follow, and I, I can't just run out there. Like, if there's another shooter outside, like, they have to understand that. Like, I'm comforted. I am. I really am. Knowing protocol was followed, more communications expected, and mainly that his daughters are safe. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Now, if you have a student at an SAISD school, make sure your contact information is up to date in the frontline parent portal so that you receive those notices. The link to make sure all of that is up to date is on our website, ksat.com. Just look for this story. Tonight, a fourth suspect in connection with a robbery and shooting death is now in police custody. According to an arrest affidavit, 20 year old Arturo Reyes was arrested for the killing of Takai Michael. It happened last May outside of the Blow Hookah Lounge in the 3900 block of Eisenhower. Reyes now facing charges of capital murder and aggravated robbery. According, uh, he is also being charged with uh, capital murder in this case is 19 year old Joseph Ortiz. Police say Ortiz posted photos of Michael's belongings on Instagram and then bragged about his death. 22 year old Nathan Cruz and 20 year old Aaron Trevino each face a capital murder charge in connection to Michael's death. Sanchez and Trevino are accused of, mult of shooting him multiple times. Police are calling it an ambush style attack. A man punched and kicked another man in the face at a popular downtown bar. According to an arrest affidavit, 28 year old Brandon Lugo got into an argument with a man inside Pat O'Brien's earlier this month. Two witnesses say Lugo sucker punched the man, knocked him to the floor, then kicked him. The victim suffered several fractures to his facial bones and got a concussion. The affidavit states Lugo said he was defending his wife, but no witness said the victim was being aggressive. He's now facing an aggravated assault charge. BCSO continues its investigation into who was behind the recruitment of nearly 50 migrants in San Antonio to be flown on a charter plane to Florida and then Massachusetts. According to BCSO, their investigators are working with the attorneys representing those migrants to obtain affidavits and verify what laws may have been violated here in Bear County. It's also a case immigration attorneys are following closely as they fear many of the asylum cases could be jeopardized as it will be difficult for migrants to appear before an immigration judge as ordered by the Department of Homeland Security. They may not have been advised of this properly because they would have to file a change of address form with the immigration court or with the reporting officer. Now they may have an order of deportation in absentia. That means they never showed up.
And while a migrant's asylum case could be reopened, Attorney Alonzo says it would be a longer process, especially when pro bono legal service providers are already saturated with immigration cases. Houston police, <clears throat> excuse me, Houston police say a person of interest is detained after a toddler was found dead in a stolen SUV and the child's father was killed. Police say the man seen in this surveillance video is responsible. This all started with an argument between the two-year-old's father and another man at a shopping center. The child's father was shot several times in the chest and then died. The gunman then drove off in the man's SUV. The stolen vehicle was later found with the two-year-old dead inside. Now to Allen, just outside of Dallas, where a truck driver dies when a tra tractor trailer drove off an overpass. You see it right there. The truck landed on a service road down below and burst into flames. Police say the semi truck hit a car that was in front of it. The driver of that car was unharmed and cooperated with law enforcement in their investigation. Police still aren't sure who's at fault in this crash. The name of the victim has not been released. Saws and CPS Energy agreed today to work together on setting up backup generators at Saws pumping sites. It's to help keep water flowing, even if the water, uh, the power isn't like it did during last year's freeze. Garrett Berger was at a meeting between the two utilities today and joins us now live. Garrett, so how many generators are we talking about here? Well, Saws is looking at putting putting generators at 36 pumping stations. Now only 15 of them would be the ones shared with CPS Energy. The boards of both utilities signed off on an agreement for that at a meeting here this afternoon. Under the plan, SAWS would pay for the natural gas generators and then CPS Energy would run them. The advantage to SAWS is clear, having the backup power to keep water coming out of spigots around the city, which didn't happen for everyone during the February freeze in 2021 when the outages also affected those pumping stations. But what's in it for CPS? Well, the electric utility would also be able to use the generators the rest of the time. Uh, CPS exec says these aren't meant to be part of their base power. It varies, right? These these generators come with like air permits and requirements, so we'll stay with all the, within all those, all those requirements. But you're probably looking on average at about 150 hours a year, uh, give or take. Saws has about 80 pumping stations in all, but the C the chief operating officer says putting generators in all of them would be too expensive. The 36 pumping stations should be enough to keep the system several pounds above the pressure levels that would require a boil no boil water notice the minimum level that a new state law requires this plan for. Now in all, SAW says that the emergency power plan would cost more than $200 million. We asked both utilities how this would affect your rates. Now CPS says it wouldn't for them, and SAW says while the shared generators wouldn't affect rates, it's less clear about the rest of the plan because when they're putting diesel generators at the other 21 sites, the cost or the effect of that on the rates hasn't quite been determined yet. Live at CPS Energy Headquarters, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Garrett. Over on the east side, a community that played a major role in the history of San Antonio is now getting a space of their own. The Native Americans who lived and worked in Spanish missions are often called San Antonio's first families. The American Indians in Texas Spanish Colonial Missions is creating a space filled with different community programs, support services, and an art gallery. Our San Antonio Fatherhood campaign, where we'll be working with young dads, helping them, um, you know, with their parenting skills. Our seventh generation doula ser uh, birthing support services. That new center will be located near South Olive and East Commerce Streets. The center will be open to the public sometime in November for their very first art show. This Saturday is the ninth annual Head for the Cure 5K Run and Walk in San Antonio. It raises awareness and funding for brain cancer research and initiatives. A Kansas City man who bravely shared his battle in an intimate documentary will be there to meet with fellow survivors. He spoke to our RJ Marquez about why he wanted the world to see his fight up close and personal. I knew that if I wasn't completely vulnerable, completely open, I was doing myself and the project and injustice, but every other survivor that could potentially see that. DJ Stewart was diagnosed with brain cancer in 2019 and told he had between a year and 18 months to live. The rarest, most aggressive form of brain tumor, 11, 18 months. Uh, but 
here I am, th- three and a half years later, no real deficits. Stewart wanted to share his story after his diagnosis. One of his best friends, Ryan Lavelle, filmed a documentary about DJ's intimate journey. The whole process of making it and what has come from it, I can never imagine not giving it everything. And the video is called Rare Enough. If I'm rare enough, so are you. The film chronicled DJ's treatments and the daily struggle to fight brain cancer. Just as important, the people that supported him every day. We had an entire city behind us and then it just it just keeps growing. But my rocks, my direct family, my wife, mom, dad, in-laws, grandma. And that's the support that DJ now wants to spread. He connected with Head for the Cure, bought an RV, and now travels to different events and gatherings, speaking to other survivors and families going through the same thing. I can't put a word on it. It's just an honor that I never could quantify in a million years. DJ and his wife will be in San Antonio for Saturday's Head for the Cure, another chance to talk about his story of survival and give a message of hope to others. It keeps working. I'm still here. I'm still doing incredible things that I would have never thought I had the honor to. So I just keep going. RJ Marquez, KSAT 12 News. Registration is open for the ninth annual Head for the Cure. The race is this Saturday. And if you use the code KSAT when you register, you get $5 off. You can find a link to register on our website at KSAT.com. Let's take a check of your Wednesday evening commute. Taking a look here through Transguide at Loop 410 and Starcrest. A little slow going over there on those lanes towards the right of your screen. Not sure what's happening there, but give your folks a little extra time if they're heading home for dinner tonight. Adam? Yeah, we're looking outside with live cam, a lot of sunshine. We don't really have those puffy cumulus clouds like we did in days past. <laughs> that upper level high, it's just sitting on us and we're looking at nothing but sunshine for the next few days. And of course, a summer-like weather pattern with August-like conditions. Today, we topped out at 95 degrees, at six degrees above average, and five degrees shy of the record, 100 set back in 1909. And our morning low temperature, 73. And I do think the mornings will be a little bit warmer over the next couple of days. Overall, right now, temperatures still in the 90s after high temperatures well into the 90s, and we're not gonna see much of a change. Actually, it's gonna get a little bit warmer over the next few days as well. You look at those highs today, 90s, tack on a few more degrees for the days ahead, but this evening, temperatures gradually falling through the 80s. Also, some tropical development we're watching. I'll have the latest spaghetti plots coming right up. We had to see my grandparents and my great grandmother lose their their homes and kind of just struggle to rebuild everything, only to have it all be swept away again. Heartbreak for San Antonians thousands of miles from their families in Puerto Rico. The fears and frustrations one woman says her family faces in the wake of Hurricane Hurricane Fiona. Plus bringing the gift of music to those living beyond san antonio city limits how these professional musicians and their grassroots orchestras are meeting a growing demand that's tonight on the night beat new at six when the pandemic hit a lot of businesses suffered but sales of wine beer and liquor surged and that had an un- unexpected effect on the body for some ursula perry reports that new research is shedding light on the link between alcohol and cancer Many Americans are unaware that alcohol and cancer are linked. In fact, one study revealed fewer than a third of adults recognize alcohol as a cancer risk factor. However, alcohol is the third leading preventable cause of cancer behind tobacco and obesity. And another recent study found one in eight cases of breast cancer, one in 10 cases of colorectal and liver cancer are attributed to alcohol use. Yes, colon cancer incidence is on the rise in young patients. And certainly, tobacco use is a big factor, alcohol is a big factor. Several health organizations, including the American Society of Clinical Oncology, have called for the federal government to add a cancer warning to alcohol labels. And the American Cancer Society has issued recently new guidelines that warn there is no safe level of alcohol consumption for cancer prevention. Maybe I would probably cut back on it a little bit, but you know, if it's a risk type scenario, I don't know that I would cut it out all the way. And those who do choose to drink should limit their intake to no more than two drinks a day for men and one drink a day for women. 
While many countries did experience an increase in drinking during the pandemic, according to the New York Times, Europe now has some of the highest rates in the world. And that may be why earlier this year, the European Union is working on perhaps adding new taxes, restrictions, and even new warnings to alcoholic beverages in an effort to reduce its cancer rate. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a look outside with Sky 12 flying over the Tobin Land Bridge there. It's always cool to see from this view, right? It is. Yeah, and it looks kind of green. You need to find a now. <laughs> shady spot there or somewhere around the park to cool out. Because yeah, there weren't too hot. many clouds providing much shade out there, though, Adam. Oh, no, not today. <laughs> not at all. And we're not going to have much natural shade for a few more days. It's going to be very summer like temperatures will be on the rise a little bit more. I mean, we're talking right near 100 tomorrow and Friday. I think we'll be just shy of it, but still right near triple digits, upper 90s, sunny and dry stretch. And then we're also watching for that potential tropical development that's headed into the Caribbean and should end up in the Gulf of Mexico as our next tropical cyclone. So let's get to it all, starting with a look at the readings outside right now. We'll start with temperatures and our temperature trend because it will be dropping off a little bit in the extended forecast. But right now we're still in the 90s, 92 Seguin, 95 New Braunfels, Divine 96, officially at the airport in town, 93 degrees, Carrizo Springs, 91. There is a cold front off to the north. It's moved through Guymon, Oklahoma there in the Panhandle, 78 degrees. Wichita earlier today was 100, now down to 85, but some 60s and 50s at this hour behind that cold front. North Platte, Omaha, Bismarck, Fargo, Minneapolis. Yeah, that's a real fall light cold front. It's just not going to make it here. We will have a very weak cold front move through on Monday, and that'll drop our high temperatures closer to 90 degrees by Tuesday and Wednesday, and actually could give us also the coolest morning we've had uh, so far this season, the coolest morning temperatures in quite some time. Otherwise, Thursday, Friday, 99 and Friday, by the way, that would tie the record. Dew points did fall off a bit this afternoon. 59 now at the airport, Converse 55, Castroville a dew point of 57. Of course, higher still near 70 degrees close to the Gulf Coast. That's typical. They don't get that same kind of mixing that we get around here in the afternoon. Next two days, you're not going to notice much humidity in the afternoon. Different story in the morning. In the morning, it's going to be muggy. By the afternoons, we'll have dew points down in the 50s. That changes a bit this weekend. And then look at the much drier air that's expected to move in with that weak cold front early next week. By Tuesday and Wednesday, we're talking dew points down in the lower 40s. Not only is that going to affect the comfort level out there, give us that more crisp feel to the air. It's not going to be a lot cooler, but it will be less humid. But that also leads to some cooler nights and cooler mornings. That drier air cools off very efficiently. Upper level high planted right overhead. Here's the big blue H. It's just sitting on top of us. No surprise around the edges of it. That's where we have the precipitation from Arizona into Utah, Colorado, eastward into the plains. We're talking Nebraska and even into Kansas as well. And that stretches eastward around here where it's it, that upper level highs is going to deflect all that activity around us that it splits this weekend and weakens and moves out opening the door for this weak cold front to move in. But it's looking like a pretty dry frontal passage, maybe a 10% chance of a rogue shower. And by the way, we have that system in moving into the uh, Caribbean right now that's likely to turn into a tropical storm, maybe even a hurricane shortly thereafter in the next three to five days and then could end up in the Gulf of Mexico. I'll have the spaghetti plots coming up in a little bit. 73 tomorrow morning by noon. We're talking 87 degrees, 99 the high temperature at 4 and 5 p.m. tomorrow. And you look at the forecast. I do think we will hit 100 in a few spots. New Braunfels 100, Seguin as well, Pleasanton 100 degrees, and then 96 into the weekend, mid 90s, closer to 90 early next week. Again, that complete tropical up update, including Fiona next half hour. Okay, thank you, Adam. After a grueling start to the season, the Roadrunners have to make some adjustments to their roster. Yeah, and it's all basically on the offensive line where they have a lot of players injured. In fact, they've lost a couple due to season-ending surgeries. When we come back, we'll let you know how they're making those adjustments for UTSA before their big game against Texas Southern this Saturday in the Alamo Dome. And who will start a quarterback for the Texas Longhorns? Coming up. 
WTSA Roadrunner says Texas Sun in the Alamo Dome this Saturday. There will be some changes on the roster due to injuries to the offensive line. Head coach Jeff Trailer confirmed today that he's moving defensive linemen to the offensive line to fill in the gaps left by those injuries. One of, for sure, who's very special to Trailer. We're going to move Walker Beatty. And uh, Walker was my very first recruit when I got here. And I still remember going to Dave and Krista's house that night and Walker and He's the first person I sat down with as a UTSA head football coach. So I really want to brag on him. I mean, he's a really good football player, and he just is doing what's best for the team. You know, we're just, we've got seven linemen injured, uh, four of them for a significant amount of time. And uh, he came over and has looked fantastic already. Hasn't complained, hasn't, I wouldn't have done it if Walker didn't want to. And it just shows, it's a great example of our football team of how they're here for the team. All right, UTSA is anywhere from 37 to 44 point favors for the 2.30 kickoff Saturday in the Alamo Dome. When the Texas Longhorns face the Texas Tech Red Raiders this Saturday, it appears they will be full strength at quarterback. Starter Quinn Hewers has been back at practice this week, suffering an SC sprain in his left non-throwing shoulder against Alabama. Hudson Carter raised any doubts about his ankle when he galloped for that big 32-yard gain against the Roadrunners. The only question is, do you rush Hewers back against a team that you beat 70-35 to last year at home? They all practice today, which is a positive. Okay, so um, that that to me is a is a really good sign. You know, last Monday they didn't all practice, so uh, to to have the point to where we are today from the quarterback situation, they were all out there, uh, which is a great sign. And uh, it wasn't, you know, everybody was in there doing their team drills and different things. I think it's the progress that Quinn's making. I think it's HUD's ability to bounce back after playing Saturday and and uh, the ankle to feel good enough to go today. So. Uh, and Malik, Malik had a good practice today as well. So a lot of positives there. We will see on Saturday when the Longhorns face the Red Raiders at 2.30. When the number 23 fighting Texas Aggies face off against the number 10 Arkansas Razorbacks, the Aggies will be looking for a little revenge. This after the Razorbacks stun a and last year in Arlington, 20 to 10, handing the Maroon and White their first loss of the season and their first loss in the SEC, snapping a nine game win streak last year. As a result, the Aggies are now just two point favorites against their old Southwest Conference foes. Coming off his first 100 yard performance of the season, the 17 to nine win over the 13th ranked Miami Hurricanes, Devon A. Chain was asked about the performance of LSU transfer Max Johnson, a quarterback who got his first ever start for A&M this past week. I know it probably was a lot of pressure for him. You know, it's his first game starting. You know, everybody, when your first day starting, you want to make a great appearance. And so I think he did good. You know, he's very calm. You know, he wasn't, I guess, after like the first couple plays and nerves was out. And so he just, uh, he was a leader. You know, he just took control of the offense. We will see how he does against Arkansas after replacing Haynes King Saturday night at 6 p.m. at AT&T Stadium in Arlington. And coming up on the night beat tonight, our KSAP Pigskin Classic 2022 Trophy Tour continues with a stop at Smithson Valley and visit with the Rangers. All right, we'll look forward to it. Thank, Thank you, Greg. You. More to come right after this. Now to New York, where President Biden addressed world leaders at the United Nations General Assembly this morning. The president delivering a harsh and direct message to President Putin, urging the U.N. to unite. It comes as Putin ramps up the war in Ukraine, calling up reservists in Russia and moving to annex large portions of Ukraine. ABC's Rena Roy with the latest. A full day for President Biden at the United Nations headquarters in New York City. The president meeting with world leaders and addressing pressing issues like climate change and world hunger, announcing a commitment of $2.9 billion in global food aid. We're also taking down the food crisis head on with as many as 193 million people around the world experience acute, acute food insecurity. A jump of 40 million in a year. But the president's main focus in his speech Wednesday, Russia's war on Ukraine. Ukraine has the same rights that belong to every sovereign nation. We will stand in solidarity with Ukraine. We will stand in solidarity against Russia's aggression, period. The president condemning Russian President Putin, who has now ordered a partial mobilization as he tries to ramp up the size of his military, threatening the use of nuclear weapons. Today, President Putin has made overt nuclear threats against Europe in a reckless disregard for the responsibilities of the non-proliferation regime. 
we always have to take this kind of rhetoric seriously. It's irresponsible rhetoric for a nuclear power to talk that way, but it's not atypical for how he's been talking the last seven months. Putin also moving to officially declare large areas of eastern and southern Ukraine part of Russia, planning to stage a referendum starting Friday. The U.S. slamming it as a sham. This all comes as Ukraine establishes a foothold in newly liberated towns in the northeast. President Zelensky is dismissing Putin's moves as noise and is thanking allies, including the U.S., for their support. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. Ex-Minneapolis police officer Thomas Lane has been sentenced to three years in prison for his involvement in George Floyd's death. Lane held down Floyd's legs as former officer Derek Chauvin restrained him in 2020. Lane pleaded guilty to aiding and abetting second-degree manslaughter earlier this year. Two other former officers turned down that plea deal offer from state prosecutors. They chose to move forward to trial, which is set to start next month. The three former officers faced both state and federal charges for their roles in Floyd's death. They were convicted of violating Floyd's civil rights in February. Lane is currently serving that two-and-a-half-year sentence in a Colorado prison. To the nation's capital, where crews are cleaning the Washington Monument after it was vandalized. You can see what's left of the red paint on the white marble. Police say Sean Deaton traveled from his home in Indiana to D.C., where he splashed the monument with paint and wrote vulgar comments yesterday morning. He's since been arrested on multiple charges with more possible. Officials say it'll take a couple weeks to clean up the mess. Port San Antonio seems to be growing each and every week. The technology campus not only bringing in businesses from all across the world, but they are also bringing in cyber experts for an international cybersecurity summit. Max Massey spoke with the CEO of DeLorean to explain what the summit means to the Alamo City. And this is this hidden gem in the southwest of Texas that people just don't realize exists. They have everything here, two million people, very long automotive history and a fantastic environment for business. The CEO of DeLorean recognizes the talent, the opportunity and the tech hub that is Port San Antonio. Next month, he's going to be speaking at the Cyber Future Summit 2022. The amount of data that we're transacting between the vehicle, the consumer and ourselves as an OEM is just massive. During the summit at the end of October, more than a thousand leading experts from around the world they will come together here in the Alamo City. International audience of cybersecurity professionals, but not just from uh, specific industries, from across multiple industries. We're talking transportation, healthcare and biosciences, um, defense. We are putting the world on notice of all the work being done here. It's another opportunity for us to further our reputation as a center for cyber operations, cybersecurity, and for talent development. We have educational opportunities. We have DeLorean. We have collaboration across the Alamo City, really putting San Antonio on the map. Uh, many of these programs are among the best in the nation, um, bringing in professionals from outside the community and seeing how we are connecting these audiences, government, industry, academia, right here on this campus is noteworthy. As for DeLorean, well, the trip back to the future, it's not too far away. On September the 30th, we're going to open up our order board and we're going to sell you reservations to our production as an NFT. And that NFT will have an avatar and you can start playing with your car well before you have the car. Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. Still ahead, tracking Fiona, where the Category 4 hurricane is headed and the devastation left behind on islands in the Atlantic. Hurricane Fiona has strengthened to a Category 4 storm, leaving a trail of destruction in the Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, and the Turks and Caicos Islands. Hundreds of thousands of Puerto Ricans still without essentials like power and water as that storm continues to move north. ABC's Jay O'Brien has the latest. Hurricane Fiona strengthening into a powerful Category 4 storm, now marching north toward Bermuda, packing winds of 130 miles an hour and leaving a trail of destruction battering the Turks and Caicos Islands, rolling through the Dominican Republic and causing what Puerto Rico's governor described as catastrophic damage. FEMA saying it's sending hundreds of additional aid workers to the U.S. territory, including two search and rescue teams. We pre-deployed 
many FEMA resources well in advance of the storm last week to ensure that we can continue to coordinate with our partners on the ground to ensure a seamless response and recovery process. And overnight, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services declaring a public health emergency on Puerto Rico. The hurricane killing at least four people on that island. Fiona's damage surveyed from Coast Guard rescue helicopters. Entire neighborhoods are still underwater, homes uninhabitable. Crews continue rushing to restore power after more than a million Puerto Ricans were left in the dark by the storm. Hundreds of thousands are also without clean drinking water as the island braces for high temperatures today. Puerto Rican officials saying yesterday they're confident most people will see power restored soon. Officials say they're also tracking several other systems churning in the Atlantic right now, one of which is Tropical Storm Gaston, which isn't expected to hit any landmass. Jay O'Brien, ABC News, Washington. Take a look outside with live cam again this afternoon. There's a few clouds out there. It's all about the heat once again this week, Adam. Yeah, it's like a... It's like August around here with this summer-like weather pattern that's taking shape. But, you know, with what we endured all summer long, yeah, we're noticing this, but we can handle it. Eh, I mean, upper 90s, that's nothing. We did have the hottest summer on record here in San Antonio. 95 was our high temperature today. That's six degrees above average and five degrees shy of the record. Hondo, 95 for the high. Gonzalez up to 96 along with Catula and New Braunfels at a high temperature of 98. Currently, we're still in the 90s. Officially at the airport, 93 degrees by 10 o'clock, 10 degrees cooler at 83, and we'll start tomorrow in the 70s. We do have some cooler mornings on the way. I'm gonna talk about that, how cool it's going to get behind our upcoming cool front, and of course, the latest on the tropics and that development we're watching in just a bit. Take a look at this on a Florida highway. This mess was caused by a massive truck crash. Five semis piled up, one of them carrying a lot of Coors Light. Luckily, there were only some minor injuries, maybe a few tears because of the spilled beer, but certainly a huge mess. That is a lot of cold ones spilled. Local police say one semi slammed into the back of another early this morning. A third semi stopped behind the crash, then a fourth along with a pickup. But a fifth semi did not stop, eventually slamming into another truck that was carrying concrete. Part of that highway had to be shut down to clean that all up. Remember that mammoth Mega Millions jackpot? Well, someone has finally stepped up to cash in the winning ticket. It's been eight weeks since that drawing. The winning ticket bought at this Speedway gas station in Des Plaines, 20 miles northwest of Chicago. Finally, two anonymous winners are claiming the $1.34 billion Mega Millions jackpot, but they won't get all that cash. They've opted to take the lump sum payment of $780.5 million, which they will split. The jackpot is the third largest in U.S. history. Firefighters in California rescuing a blind dog that was trapped in a construction hole. The owner says her 13-year-old dog, Caesar, fell about 15 feet into a hole at a construction site in Pasadena Tuesday night. A search and rescue team was called to that scene. They hooked up a series of ropes and pulleys, then lowered one of the team members into the hole. It took them about 12 minutes to reach Caesar. But once they did, they were able to secure him in a harness and bring him back up to the surface. Caesar appeared to be healthy and uninjured and very happy. Today is World Alzheimer's Day, a day to raise awareness about the disease and its impact on patients, their families and caregivers. It is the most common type of dementia affecting some 44 million people across the globe. It is one of the 10 leading causes of death here in the U.S., according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Alzheimer's disease is progressive and begins with mild memory loss, possibly leading to response, less responsiveness over time. That's according to the CDC. If you'd like to observe World Alzheimer's Day, wear a purple bracelet or ribbon today. All right, Adam, we've got a couple of ball players chasing some home run records. Is there a chance we could break our 100 degree day record here in the next two days? There's a chance, but I give it about a 30% shot, really. Um, I, I think we'll be just below 100 degrees. I know we're one day away from the all-time record, at least tying the all-time record of 100 degree days in a year, but I think we'll be about 99, the high the next few days, of course. 
it's within the realm of possibility that we do hit triple digits. But I also want to talk about low temperatures. Take a look at this. We'll be in the 70s the next several mornings. That's where we're used to. But as I mentioned last half hour, you know, we have that weak cold front moving in on Monday. Tuesday will be down to 67 in the morning. Then Wednesday, we're going to be down to 64 in the morning, and that would be our coolest reading so far this season since late May. So there is a little bit of relief from at least the morning warmth out there. Upper level high, big blue H, it's right overhead. I mean, this is directly overhead us, uh, overhead and just pushing down on us. It's deflecting all the active weather far away from us, up and around the edges of that big upper level ridge. And actually something you don't see too often is severe thunderstorms and even severe thunderstorm potential in Utah and Idaho. That's where the action is right now. That moisture streaming northward from Arizona northward then arcing into the Midwest and central US. Hurricane Fiona right now, very strong storm. Category four hurricane, max sustained winds at 130 miles per hour with some gusts up to 160. Central pressure at 934 millibars. So this is headed to the north northeast, likely to just brush past Bermuda on Friday. But at that point, still a category four and even without direct landfall on Bermuda, obviously still affecting that island and then gradually weakening as it heads northward toward Canada, still packing a punch into parts of eastern Canada uh, days day, in the days ahead over the next uh, five days or so. Let's take a look at the rest of the tropics, though. We've got tropical storm Gaston. That's eh, just out in the ocean. Wait, North Atlantic. It's a fish storm. It's going to stay there. One little wave coming off of Africa, 30% chance of development. We're really focused on this area that's got the 90%, so a high likelihood of development here into our next tropical cyclone, meaning next tropical depression, then likely a tropical storm. And I do think this has a high potential of turning into a hurricane as well. Here are the computer models. Notice how there's a very good consensus of this De potential or I should say future development heading into the Caribbean through this weekend and then we get into early next week and it really could f fall anywhere in the central or eastern Gulf of Mexico. Uh, that's what it's looking like right now and there's of course some different solutions out there and some wide ranging ones. So it's something that we need to watch right now as we look forward to next week. But it's remember it's difficult to predict something that hasn't even developed yet. You know, it hasn't developed into a storm yet. We can't measure it. And without those measurements and that data, it's very difficult to predict it. So something we have to just be patient and watch for. 93 right now, dew point of 59. That's nice. So the heat index, not an issue. 90 in Carrizo Springs and Kerrville, 89 Fredericksburg. Canyon Lake at 90 degrees, Converse right now at 94, along with Stinson Airport on the south side. Dew points drop down nicely this afternoon, in some cases in the 50s. I think tomorrow's going to be even more of a drastic drop, which will help heat us up more because that dry air warms up very efficiently. Muggy in the morning with a dew point of 70, but by the afternoon, that dew point drops into the 50s. Sunshine all day long, 73 the temperature in the morning. By noon, we're 91 into the afternoon. Seguin, New Braunfels, 100 along with Pleasanton. We're thinking about 99 officially here in San Antonio, at least at the airport where we have our official records. But some neighborhoods will be hitting triple digits the next couple of days near 90 for highs by next week. OK, we'll see if we get there. Thanks, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next. It is Wednesday, September 21st. The search is on for the truck driver who left this deadly accident, which they may have caused. A white SUV found with the front driver's side door ripped from its hinges and a person killed. This was on I-37 in Atascosa County near the Bear County line. They believe they found the truck involved, but the driver had already run off. This is a picture of a similar truck that the Atascosa Sheriff's Office posted online during their search. If you have any information in this case, you can call DPS at 210 -5 Three one twenty two eighty. Let's take you back to August. All the teams participating in the Little League World Series in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, in town. But before the team from Utah even suited up for a game, 12-year-old Easton Oliverson fell out of his top bunk of his bed in one of the players' dorms and suffered a severe head injury. But the family is now suing the Little League and the maker of the bed. They claim that Easton fell because the bed was defective and dangerous and there was no railing. 
If you can't wait till February for some rodeo action, don't worry. The Comal County Fair rodeo is kicking off. It has been described as the largest county fair in Central Texas. The event begins at 5 p.m. today and ends on Sunday in New Braunfels. And admission is free for opening day today. Nick Erickson is usually the one riding his surfboard, but when he left it empty for a moment after catching a wave off Santa Cruz, a sea otter figured it ought to be the one riding it. Nick's tactics range from the puny trying to splash the sea otter to the brave attempting to tow it towards shore. Finally, another surfer came to the rescue, managing to shove the board away from the otter. Oh, check that out tomorrow. We're talking well into the 90s. Rio Medina 97, Hondo 99, Floresville as well. Elmendorf, Von Army, right about 100 degrees, along with New Braunfels and Seguin. So record challenging territory, flirting with 100 the next few days. By the way, fall equinox tomorrow at 8.04 p.m. And then this weekend, temperatures fall off a little bit and closer to 90 next week. Thanks, Adam. And thank you for watching the news at 6. See you back here for the Night Beat tonight at 10. Have a good evening.